I'm delighted to have an opportunity to speak with General Frank Gorant, who's the commander of US Air Forces in Europe, uh, Air Forces in Africa, and also um, the Allied Air Commander for NATO, um, particularly at this week as we're about to go into the NATO summit. Um, there are some very interesting challenges in all of your theatres of operations, um, and as you come to the end of your tour, I'm absolutely delighted to be able to speak to you about um, some of the challenges that Air Forces are facing, both here in Europe and, and overseas as well. Uh, so, General, as we um, go into the NATO summit this week, um, there's been a much greater emphasis on deterrence um, across all the environments. Um, and I wondered if you might expand on that um, and what that might mean specifically for Air Forces in Europe going forwards. Well, I think that, uh, that, that NATO is a defensive alliance. You know, NATO depends on a strong collective security arrangement, you know, that basically uh, brings the best of all of the allies together in a way uh, that creates a solidarity, creates a, uh, an understanding that uh, we're here to help each other. And uh, certainly along the way, it sends a message to anybody who would be aggressive uh, towards NATO, particularly with respect to obligations in the treaty, that we are prepared and uh, we are prepared to uh, defend uh, NATO as envisioned uh, in the, in the uh, Washington Treaty. Uh, of course, air plays a large part of that. We have a, a, a very significant standing mission that we execute. Uh, every single day we have a very high readiness of uh, air component uh, uh, inside of NATO and, uh, and of course we've been exercising that. Along the way, uh, we've been uh, accounting for emerging threats, which are also emerging, uh, which require emerging capabilities, and so uh, we're busy doing that. We've been operating ballistic missile defense uh, along the way, 24-7, 365, in an interim mode, and uh, we're on the cusp of transitioning uh, to an initial operational capability whenever the leadership is ready to declare that. So... It seems, looking at what we discussed at Wales and what seems to be on the table um, this year, uh, there seems to be a lot of focus on land and maritime forces. Yes. Um, and yet, when you look at some of the potential scenarios going forwards, that it will be air that will need to respond immediately because, um, frankly, being able to transport our forces to um, the area of threat um, is going to take a while anyway. Yes. Um, uh, there is a discussion about um, developing a NATO air power strategy or updating it, uh, and I wondered whether you could um, expand on that. Well, Allied Command Trans Transformation has that project to do, and we are developing that, that, that air strategy. You are right. Uh, the results of the, uh, of the whale summit, which basically came to the conclusion that the readiness and the responsiveness of NATO needs to be uh, revamped. There have been a series of adaptation measures, a series of assurance measures, you know, that have gone forward. Uh, they are seemingly land heavy, uh, but we have been working uh, with uh, Allied Command Ops, you know, shape to make sure that the air portion of the, of any kind of response uh, would be accounted for and, uh, and, and we're working along with our, with the other components inside of NATO uh, to make sure that it truly is a a uh, very high readiness joint task force. And so along the way we're doing the assurance measures uh, that the uh, Secretary of State for Defense talked about and, uh, and now we're kind of, like you mentioned, transitioning to uh, uh, not only the assurance part of it to our allies but the deterrence uh, effect of a strong conventional force. Sure. Um, the Russians have been quite active Yes. Um, both in terms of using their own air forces, but also in denying airspace. Um, we've seen this clearly in, in Syria, and that's had an impact on uh, our operations in the counter-ISIL um, uh, efforts. But um, uh, also there is now um, S-400 in Kaliningrad, and I wondered if you might um, uh, discuss some, yeah, what that might mean for us. The assessment that they've been active is, is correct. The alarming part of it is they've been active across what I consider to be the full spectrum of activity for military. Sure. Organize, training, equipping, deploying, mm -hmm. and employing. And so since Wales 
uh, uh, you can see in every area that they have been not only eager to execute, but they've also been eager to display significant increases in capability, particularly in the air. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned it, you know, I like to say that there's been an A to AD environment established in Europe that rivals anything that's in the Pacific. You know, I believe that Kaliningrad is probably the best defended piece of airspace in the world. And uh, there's a A to AD environment from sea to shining sea in Europe. From the Barents to the Baltics to the Black Sea, now to the Mediterranean Sea. Uh, there have been clearly moves to intimidate uh, uh, our, uh, our allies and partners. Uh, there's been rhetoric, you know, at the political level. I'm not a political guy, but clearly I understand, you know, uh, uh, an implied threat. And, uh, you know, and I think that's something that needs to be accounted for. And I think that uh, the combination of the Wales Summit ra uh, Readiness Action Plan uh, combined with the steady training that we're doing um, uh, heel to toe all over Europe, uh, I think we're well on our way to be able to address that threat. Great. Um, this year we saw um, F-22 deployed to Lake and Heath and, um, and then forward to Eastern Europe. Um, we see this year um, F-35 um, arriving in Europe, at least to visit to start with, um, and the European forces will start to build up. Um, at the LAN conference that we ran a week ago, um, there was a lot of concern about A2AD and what it might mean for ground forces. Um, their assumption is that they may not have air cover. Um, can you explain what stealth will mean um, for European Air Force and for NATO forces more generally, and how you think that will play into yeah, this environment? I was, I was eager to get the F-22 into theatre, just to make sure that um, uh, we are able to bring the aircraft here, we're able to operate off of our bases, we introduce it to all of our allies, uh, because it had not been uh, in Europe before. It's a significant response to the A2AD environment and the capabilities inherent uh, in that are really important. But, you know, I think it's, you know, we talk about A2AD like it's, a, it's, it's the end state. A2AD is there for a reason. Uh, A2AD at the strategic level is designed to inhibit freedom of movement, and that freedom of movement uh, basically uh, is a way to nibble away and crack our conventional deterrents and to crack our nuclear deterrents. And so uh, uh, the introduction of, of the new technologies uh, I think is important to bring into Europe just so they understand geography, flying in Europe, and those kinds of things. Uh, and stealth is important in that. Obviously, uh, since the first Gulf War, the benefits of stealth have clearly been demonstrated, and, uh, and, and that is important. What's more important is the sensor fusion and the ability of the aircraft that we're talking about to move data from machine to machine in a very quick way that basically enables us to uh, make decisions at a much faster rate uh, particularly engagement decisions uh, than normal. And so uh, it's more than stealth. It's about the information. It's about the movement of the information. It's about uh, making sure that we limit to the maximum extent possible any kind of collateral damage that would be done by kinetic strikes. And then, of course, to be able to begin the process of providing information to the rest of government, to the rest of our partners, uh, to be able to leverage all of the capability in the other domains, you know, and it's the synergy, the multi-domain mm -hmm. synergy that is really going to elevate NATO and give them a clear asymmetric advantage, such an asymmetric advantage that it will by itself have a deterrent effect. And so I think that's the important part of introducing fifth generation capability. I'm also happy, of course, that, you know, many of the partners in the F-35 program uh, are in Europe, and I'm really salivating at the idea of having NATO allies flying a common platform because uh, the interoperability provided by that common platform, I think, will elevate the quality of the game, not in a linear way, but in an exponential way. And so the potential uh, 
uh, for the new technologies and with stealth, with centrifusion, you know, and with some of the other multi-domain approaches is simply a spectacular thing to think about for the future. Now, the fact that we have land domain actors actively talking about A2AD environment is nothing but good for an air component man. You know, our alliance, Americans in general, have become accustomed to operating in an environment where any kind of attack from the air is absolutely unthinkable. Mm -hmm. And uh, the enemy understands that, they understand the freedom of action that provides, and I think it is their intent to deny what has become a standard for operations with a Western mindset. And that's operations with complete air dominance. The ability to do anything we want on the ground without fear of attack from the air. And that's a significant uh, event for somebody who operates in the ground domain or for anybody that's operating on the ground uh, uh, trying to handle some of the challenges of today. Do you think there's actually a role for land forces to help combat absolutely. A2AD? I, absolutely. I, you know, don't get me wrong. I think, you know, when I talk about A2AD, this is not a problem that is not solvable. We have significant capability and we're working on it uh, with respect from the air component, but I think across the board among all of the other components, they have capabilities that brought together in a way, in a joint way, will actually make taking down that IADS or that air A2AD environment uh, much more effective and much longer lasting. So, I mean, again, I, I search for those opportunities and I, I think that a multi-domain approach to this A2AD environment, which is really designed to inhibit our conventional deterrence, is the way to go. And so I welcome, you know, the other uh, domain owners uh, to come on in and help us with that problem because it is significant. So, um, finally, a lot of what you've described requires quite a sophisticated Air Force and, right. and a certain amount of training and quality of personnel. Um, is there a risk that we end up with a, with a two-tier NATO alliance with those who, who are not quite there? And, and how do we bring uh, some of those uh, nations and, and Air Forces um, uh, into that new environment? Yeah, it, it's an excellent question. And, uh, you know, uh, as the NATO commander, I see every day, you know, I have air forces with significant capability and capacity. I have air forces with significant capability, but not as much capacity as the others. I, I have air forces that don't really have a lot of capability, therefore they don't have any capacity. But inside of an alliance, there are ways to continue to develop and nurture that force and to introduce uh, less capable air forces to, to high-end air force capabilities. Mm -hmm. And, you know, again, that's an exciting area, you know, but it requires some inspirational leadership, you know, particularly from the politicians that pay the bills back home and have to pay it. But a classic example of this is the pooling and sharing arrangement, you know, that is developed by the heavy airlift wing in Hungary. You know, there are many partners in that uh, memorandum of understanding organization that have, have had no possibility whatsoever of owning and operating a C-17. But together, inside of that organization, they're able to participate in the generation of airlift capability, which is a significant shortfall in NATO. And so I see opportunities across the board in an alliance, you know, that's being driven by inspired leadership and a desire to take their country to the next level and actually participate in NATO the way it's envisioned. There are lots of opportunities. I could rip off a whole bunch of ideas right here, but the fact of the matter is, is there, the, the, the engine of error are the people. Mm -hmm. And if we can tap into those subject matter experts of even the less capable air forces, we have a much greater capacity than we have now. And so that's what we've been doing for the last three years, you know, and that's where we're gonna continue to go uh, not because it's a nice thing to do, it's because we don't have any choice. Particularly in these resource constrained environments. General, thank you so much. It's been fascinating talking to you and um, 
Uh, we look forward to what the summit um, delivers this week. Thank you. You're welcome.